وأقول في القرآن ما جاءت به آياته فهو الكريم المنزل وأقول قال الله جل جلاله والمصطفى الهادي ولا أتأول الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على عبد الله ورسوله نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We begin as always by praising Allah and by asking Allah to exalt the mention grant peace to our messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to his family and his companions We have been talking about issues relating to marital discord and we talked about general principles and things that can help us in solving marital discord. We're going to go a little bit more into the fiqh of marital discord right now and a bit more into the details of it and look at an nushuz. An nushuz is a word that is most often used in relation to a woman and her husband, but it can also be used in relation to the husband and his wife. So we're going to look at what the word means. We're going to look at some of the rulings related to it and some of the solutions that Islam gives and what those solutions really mean in a practical sense. So the word an-nushuz in a linguistic sense means al-isti'asa wal imtina' wa tarafur And it's from an-nashz, which is, uh, it, it means irtafa'a wa dhahar. So linguistically, it comes from refusal, uh, it comes from a, a person refusing something, a person just, you know, tarafu, just, I, I don't want to have anything to do with this, uh, and sort of a person, if you like, um, sort of standing up and saying, I'm not going to, I'm not going to listen anymore, or I'm not going to, I'm not going to follow anymore, and kind of sort of becoming like, Vahara, becoming apparent and standing up uh, and sort of, uh, if you like, a degree of rebellious, rebelliousness, if that's the right word. So these are some of the linguistic meanings around the word and nushuz. As for in the Sharia of Islam, then and nushuz, it is in terms of the woman. It is for a woman to disobey her husband in what Allah has made obligatory for her to obey him in. So she refuses to obey her husband. She says, I'm no longer able or I'm no longer willing to obey you in this thing that Allah has required me to obey you in. And we've already spoken about what about the different things that a woman is required to obey her husband in. And she says, I'm not, I'm not willing to do that anymore. So she is what is called nashiza. She is a woman who is who is in a state of nushuz, in a state of, uh, you can say, disobedience, rebelliousness, where the marriage is broken down to such an extent where she says, I'm no longer willing or I'm no longer able to obey you in the things which Allah has made obligatory for me to obey you in. And this situation of an-nushuz is mentioned in the Qur'an. Allah Azza wa mentions it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us solutions for it. But it's also the case that it's not only mentioned with regard to the woman. As we're going to see later on, it's also mentioned as it relates to the man. So there's no doubt that the woman who is in a state of nushuz, she is the one who has raised herself up over her husband. She said, I'm not willing to, to listen to what he says anymore. And I am no, I'm going to turn my back on him and I'm going to turn away from him. And that is what we call an nushuz. And as we said, we're going to hear later on that it can come from the husband as well. So what is the ruling of an nushuz as it relates to the woman? The madahib al fiqhi al-arba'a, the, the, the different madahib, the Hanafiya, the Malikiya, the Shafi'iya, the Hanabila, are in agreement on this issue that it is forbidden for a woman to fall into an nushuz. It's not allowed for her to fall into an nushuz, into the state of disobedience and rebelliousness. And if she does so, her husband has certain things that are available to him by way of remedy 
for this situation that it's got into. And we want to make it clear, the situation that it gets into it is, it is because uh, something has happened to, to get it to that position. Something has gone wrong. And in the beginning, it may be something, the nushuls may be relatively minor. The rebellious nature may be relatively minor. And it may be possible to fix it with relatively minor things. But as we're going to hear, it can get it can get more and more severe, the breakdown in the marriage that happens. And we, we can recognize this from the woman's side when she's no longer willing to show obedience to her husband in the things that Allah Azza wa Jal had legislated for her to show obedience in. And the main reference that we have for the steps that her husband has available to him is ayah number 34 in Surah An-Nisa. Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَاللَّاتِ تَخَافُونَ نُشُوزَهُنَّ فَعِذُوهُنَّ وَاهْجُرُوهُنَّ فِي الْمَضَاجِعِ وَضْرِبُوهُنَّ فَإِنْ أَطَعْنَكُمْ فَلَا تَبْغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيًّا كَبِيرًا This ayah really has everything that we need to relate to the topic of nushuz from the point of view of the woman. And that is that those women that you fear their nushuz, you fear that they're going to have be rebellious towards you and that they're not going to obey you anymore. So the marriage has broken down, something has gone wrong. The woman says, I'm not listening to you anymore in the things that Allah has obliged me to listen. When they got married, they had this understanding. They had these important conditions, this important mithaq and covenant that existed, this amana from Allah, this set of responsibilities for the husband and the wife, but something is broken down. And she says, I'm no longer willing to obey my husband. I'm no longer willing to listen to my husband. And this is haram. And this is haram in agreement of all of the madahib. It's haram for her to do this. And the solution is not for her to fall into this disobedience of her husband. That's not the solution. However, she falls into it. So what is available to her husband? Allah Azza wa Jal provides a number of remedies. And these remedies are taken in stages. Fa'idhuhunna. This is the very first one. Admonish them. So in the beginning, Allah Azza wa Jal didn't take this issue and make it bigger than it needs to be. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, if you see from your wife some kind of nushuz, some kind of refusal, some kind of uh, disobedience, then you have to admonish her. Speak to her. And this admonishment, Allah Azza wa Jal didn't give it a time limit. He didn't say, فَعِذُوهُنَّ usbu'a." فَعِذُوهُنَّ شَهْرًا فَعِذُوهُنَّ سَنَةً فَعِذُوهُنَّ سَنَتَيْنَ Allah didn't say a month or a week or a year or two years. Allah didn't give it a time limit. To keep it up to the husband and to keep it as flexible as possible. So let him talk to his wife. Let him be kind to her. Let him start with gentleness because of what we've heard about of rifq and a lean softness and gentleness, and that rifq was never put into anything except that it made it beautiful, and it was never taken out of anything except that it made it ugly. So let the husband be gentle with her. Let the husband be soft with her. Let the husband talk to her and remind her about her obligations. Let him also look at his own faults and try to correct them. And let there be a degree of admonishment from him. So he can say to her, look, this is not right for you to do this. And he can also increase this admonishment over time. In the sense, he can be a little bit more uh, serious about it. He can be a little bit more strict about it if he sees that that softness and gentleness isn't working. But in the beginning, his first step before he goes anywhere else and takes any other steps is uh, is admonishment and to verbally speak to her and ask her to go back to obedience and back to uh, what Allah has commanded. And that's why Allah Azza wa Jal said, فَإِنْ أَطَعْنَكُمْ If those women start to obey you and they come back, فَلَا تَبَغُوا عَلَيْهِنَّ سَبِيلًا Don't try to do anything to them. 
Inna Allah kana aliyan kabira. Allah is the most high and the most great. And it's a, that's a threat from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala of punishment for the man who he's admonished his wife, he's spoken to his wife, he, and she's gone back. She's gone back to what she should have done. It's not allowed for him to do anything further. That's where he stops. But sometimes this warning and admonishment and him verbally saying to her and reminding her and he might be patient in that for a very long time but it doesn't benefit. So now he has another remedy which is available to him and that is Al-Hajr. And abandon them in the bed. Actually, there are two types of hajr that are available to the husband. The first is the one which is mentioned in the ayah, fil Abandon them in the bed. And even this, like the idha, like the warning and the admonishment, it has levels to it. And what we mean by that is, like we said, the admonishment can start off with a soft word, then a little bit more stern, then a little bit more serious, and so on. Likewise, the hajr can start off with just turning his back on his wife, just not putting his hand on her when he goes to sleep, you know, just being distant from her in the bed. And then it can go as far as him turning around in the bed on the other side. And then it can go as far as him sleeping on the floor next to the bed and so on. Like it can, it can go like that. But he doesn't want this hajr to go outside of the house. He doesn't want it to become knowledge of, of, of everyone in the play and all of the family members at this point. Because one of the principles we have, and we didn't mention this in the principles, but it was one of the principles, we mention it now, which is that the mashakil, the problems between the husband and the wife, they should stay between the husband and the wife as much as is possible. And as much as is is as much as it can be kept in the house, it should be kept in the house. And as little as you can involve other people, that's better. The less you involve people, the better it is. So the abandonment, the hajr of her should be something private that only those two know about. And from the people of knowledge are those who said that even the children should not know about it where possible. fil The second type of hajr that is indicated is Al-Hajr fil kalam that he abandons her in speech. He abandons her in speech. He doesn't speak to her. And this is indicated in a hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which is a general hadith in which uh, in the hadith is narrated by Abi Ayyub Al-Ansari radiyallahu an anna Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam qal la yahillu li muslimin an yahjura akhahu fawqa thalatha layali it is not allowed for a Muslim to make hajr of his brother more than three nights, three days. It's not allowed to stop speaking to someone for more than three days. So if he doesn't speak to his wife, he's not allowed to go over the three days that is set out for him in the Sharia. As for abandoning his wife in the bed, then this is something which is also narrated in a hadith an Umm Salama radiyallahu anha annaha qalat anna an-nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam halafa an la yadkhul ala ba'd ahlihi shahra falamma mada tis'atun wa 20 yawma ghada alayhim aw rah faqila lahu halafta ya nabiyya Allah an la tadkhul alayna shahra قَالَ إِنَّ الشَّهَرْ يَكُونُ تِسْعًا يَكُونُ تِسْعَةً وَعِشْرِينَ يَوْمًا That the Prophet ﷺ had made an oath that he would not stay with his wives for a month. And that is when they asked him for an increase in provision. I, they asked him for more, uh, and the, they, they asked him for more of the dunya, more of the provisions of the world, worldly life. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he made an oath that he would not stay with them for a month. And when 29 days had passed, he came to them in the morning or the evening, and it was said to him, O Prophet of Allah, 
you had made an oath to Allah that you will not come to see us, you will not stay with us for a month. He said, sometimes the month is 29 days in length. So this also tells us the permissibility of a man abandoning his family uh, in terms of wahjuruhunna fil madajir, keep away from them in uh, the bed when the situation reaches to a certain level. And it also reminds us that these are matters that happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in terms of uh, this issue of wahjuruhunna fil madajir, keep away from them in the bed or abandon them in the bed. And as we said, as much as these issues can be kept privately, that's what should happen. But sometimes the matter is known, and no doubt the Prophet ﷺ was unique in that sense, in the sense that the, the things that happened to him were examples and lessons for all of us to learn from. And so this matter became known, and uh, it actually got to the time when the, a rumor was spread that the Prophet ﷺ had divorced his wives. And then it became clear that he had not divorced them, but rather he had just distanced himself from them because of this unreasonable request that was made. What happens though if this hajar in kalam and al hajar fil madajir, this abandoning them and speaking to them and abandoning them in the bed, it doesn't work? So now we come to one of the really important parts of the ayah, wadribu hunna. And this is the last one mentioned in this ayah, wadribu hunna. Darb. Darb, the word daraba, yadribu darban. This word, it means to hit. But it covers a very wide variety of hitting. And so when you see people say that the Quran gives permission for a man to beat his wife, then this is something that no person of intellect and no person who has the smallest knowledge of Islam would think is true. Rather, Islam does not give a man permission to beat his wife. Islam gives a man, in a certain situation, with certain conditions, permission to hit his wife in a certain way with a certain set of rules and regulations. No doubt Allah does not oppress anyone. And Allah has made a dhulm haram, he's made oppression haram. And the Prophet ﷺ forbade the beating of, uh, of a man beating his wife. And we're going to come to these ahadith and talk about the conditions. So what does it actually mean, wadribu hunna? And what are the conditions of that hitting, which is the third level after admonishment, after abandoning, wadribu hunna? So what does this mean? actually what does this actually mean the first condition that the scholars and the people of knowledge put is that the husband must believe or at least have some sort of belief that this is going to actually make a difference in this day and age if you see what the scholars say about a man hitting his wife they say like with a, a siwak with a, a a tooth stick a toothbrush or some of them with a, a mindil, with a, with a handkerchief, with a tissue, you know, it's, or some of them with an isba, with a finger, just like that, just touching, just tapping like that, nothing. So the first condition is that he has to believe that this is actually going to make a difference. It's actually going to make her think, subhanAllah, this husband that was so good to me and kind to me, for him to take his toothbrush, and tap me on the wrist with a toothbrush, he must re I must really have done something really, really wrong. And I must really come back to what Allah has commanded me to do. And if that's not gonna happen, then this option is not an option for him. It's only an option for him if he believes that this is actually going to make her change her decision and change her behavior. That's the first condition. The second condition, is that it is darban ghayra mubarrih. And that's because of the hadith of Jabir in Sahih Muslim. فَإِنْ فَعَنَّ ذَلِكْ فَضْرِبُوهُنَّ darban ghayra mubarrih. The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith of Jabir in Sahih Muslim, if they do this, and he mentioned certain acts of disobedience, then you may strike them 
is striking which does not, which is not mubarrih so the word mubarrih it comes from al barah or al barah and this is al mashaqqa this is something which is hard something which is difficult to bear uh, meaning that it should not cause any pain and it should not cause any bruising and it should not be difficult to bear so that excludes everything or almost everything that would be in a typical person's mind when it comes to a wife hitting when it comes to a husband hitting his wife typically none of what would be in a person's mind something painful bruising beating all of that is excluded from this hadith darban ghayra mubarrih but a husband who raises one finger or two fingers or a miswak or siwak or you know a, a, a like a handkerchief and he taps his wife on the hand try this if this is the this is like the final or one of the final stages in dealing with annushus and ultimately when you see the limits that Islam put upon this it really isn't the issue that people make it out to be and in the hadith of uh, Mu'awiyah al-Qushayri radiyallahu an wala tadrib al-wajh is that the man is not allowed even that light hitting that is with his finger he's not allowed to hit her on the face and he's not allowed to hit her hard and the Prophet really rebuked this he said don't let one of you beat his wife don't let one of you beat his wife the way that someone would beat a slave then he goes and he sleeps with her at the end of the day he goes and he has intimacy with her at the end of the day how can one of you beat your wife and then be intimate with her in the end of the night and that is a really you know that that's it that shows the rebuke of the Prophet ﷺ towards that. Then add to this that the Prophet ﷺ said about the men who hit even with one finger or two finger that those are not khiyarikum, those are not the best among you. What about an-nushuz when it comes from the husband? And how can even nushuz come from the husband? How can it be if we said that nushuz from the woman is to disobey her husband? How can nushuz come from the husband? Well, this is also mentioned in Surah An-Nisa in ayah number 128. And if a woman fears from her husband nushuz or fears that he will turn away from her, he will abandon her, then there is no harm upon them in making a sulh between one another or sulhu khair, and making peace between each other and an agreement between each other is something good. So the nushuz here is either ill treatment or i'rad, it could be also explained as i'rad, that he just doesn't want anything to do with her. He's, he doesn't, he doesn't, it's like he doesn't want to keep her as a wife anymore. He doesn't take it seriously anymore. He doesn't want to be with her anymore. And he's distant from her. And the feeling is that there, you know, that even maybe matters of intimacy and things like that, he just became distant from her. And he is either abandoning her or she fears that he might treat her badly. Then in this case, there is no harm in the two of them coming to an agreement which is a sulh and the meaning of the sulh here is that the couple agree to forego certain rights or the wife agrees to forego certain rights to give up certain rights in order to stop this nushuz or this i'rad to stop this ill treatment or to stop this turning away from her husband turning away from her so for example, it might be the case that the woman, she uh, is getting older and she feels that she's not really able to um, maybe to, to 
to keep up with what her husband expects from her. And she fears that it might come to the stage where her husband will divorce her or where her husband might no longer see, no longer want to keep her as a wife because things have changed between them and things have broken down in a little way between them. And it might not be the fault of either of the two of them. It might be something like age or it might be, you know, the fact that the woman, she fears uh, that this might happen or she senses that this might happen. Then there's no harm in them coming to an agreement. And that agreement could be, for example, that she gives up some of her rights. Like uh, she, let's say, for example, she has a co-wife. She says, my co-wife can take my night. I want to stay married to my husband. I want him to give me my rights. But the night that was usually mine, I'm willing to give it up for my co-wife, for example. And they make an agreement like that. And this is what sometimes we, we might even call in English separation. I staying apart from one another, whereby it's not a divorce, but they agree maybe just to forego some of their rights. Maybe they agree to give up some of their rights and make a peace between them, make a sulh between them. And a sulh is something good if it saves the marriage. If that's what saves the marriage and it just needs, you know, that some of the rights are given up in order to make a peace between them and in order to save the marriage, then there's nothing wrong with doing that. There's nothing wrong with saving the marriage like that and making the peace between them uh, like that. So what happens then if the issue goes even beyond that and even the sulh isn't working and the the uh, the idha, the warnings, the admonishment, uh, the, um, the hajar leaving her alone, abandoning her in the bed, uh, even potentially, you know, the hitting in accordance with what Islam allowed, the issue of a sulh, none of it worked. What did Allah Azza wa Jal give as a final uh, sort of option before we start to talk about the issue of divorce? Allah Azza wa Jal said, وَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ شِقَاقَ بَيْنِهِمَا فَبَعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا إِنْ يُرِيدَ إِصْلَاحٍ يُوَفِّقِ اللَّهُ بَيْنَهُمَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلِيمًا خَبِيرًا Allah Azza wa Jal said, and if you fear shiqaq, and the meaning of shiqaq is that one of them is on one side and one of them is on the other. Completely, they have completely gone against each other. One is on one side and one is completely opposing. They've gone totally against each other. فَبَعَثُوا حَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهِ وَحَكَمًا مِنْ أَهْلِهَا Send a judge from his family and a judge from her family. If they wish to get back together, Allah will make the tawfiq, Allah will bring them back together, will bring them, Allah will make it possible for them to come back together. Indeed, Allah is knowing of everything and aware of everything. So to understand this a little bit better, let's look at what Al-Imam Ibn Kathir, he said about this ayah. He said, قَالَ الْفُقَهَا The scholars of fiqh, they said, إِذَا وَقَعَ الشِّقَاقُ بَيْنَ الزَّوْجَيْنِ If major issue, issues happen between the husband and the wife and they become totally separated, أَسْكَنَهُمَا الْحَاكِمْ إِلَى جَنْبِ ثِقَةٍ يَنْظُرُ فِي أَمْرِهِمَا In this case, the ruler or the judge gives them to somebody responsible who's going to look at the issue that's happening between them. This could be like someone in the position of a counsellor or someone who's going to look at that matter and try to, uh, someone reliable who's going to try to solve what's happening between them. Someone's going to get involved and try to solve the problems that are existing uh, between them. وَيَمْنَعُ الظَّالِمَ مِنْهُمَا مِنَ الظُّلْمِ and stops the one who is oppressing the other from their oppression, whether it's the husband oppressing the wife or the wife oppressing the husband. فَإِن تَفَاقَمَ أَمْرُهُمَا وَطَالَتْ خُصُومَتُهُمَا بَعَثَ الْحَاكِمْ ثِقَةً مِنْ أَهْلِ الْمَرْأَةِ وَثِقَةً مِنْ قَوْمِ الرَّجُلِ And if the matter goes even beyond that, like even the one marriage counselor, they can't, they can't make the peace, they can't separate the oppression and the oppressed one and they can't make that peace between them, and the, the argumentation keeps on going and it becomes prolonged, 
then what he does is the judge, he chooses one person from the family of the woman and one person from the, the man's people, one from the woman's side and one from the man's side. لِيَجْتَمِعَ To come together. فَيَنْظُرَ فِي أَمْرِهِمَ And then that, they, all those two people, they look at what's happening to the husband and what's happening to the wife. وَيَفْعَلَ مَا فِيهِ الْمَصْلَحَةَ مِمَّا يَرَيَانِهِ مِنَ التَّفْرِيقِ أَوْ التوفيق. And then they decide what is best for that husband and wife and what's going to bring about good for them, either that they break apart or either that they come back together. And then he said, and then he said, وَتَشَوَّفَ الشَّارِعُ إِلَى التَّوْفِيقِ and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encouraged them to try and find that way of bringing them back together. So this is really a beautiful explanation from an Imam ibn Kathir rahimahullah ta'ala that just explains how this process would work. So it might begin with just one person, like a marriage counselor who just looks at the issue and tries to solve it, but he can't solve it. So he goes back to the judge and the judge says, okay, Bring me one from the man's family, one from the woman's family. Why the man's family? Why the woman's family? Because they're more likely that those two are going to know the situation and understand the problem and try and make peace between them. They come together, they talk to each other, and they try to find a way to solve the problem. Either they decide that the couple are going to separate or they decide that the couple are going to come together and Allah Azza wa Jal encouraged them to find a way to make that couple to get back together again. That's what Allah Azza wa Jal made easy for me to mention in this episode on Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabiyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamu alaikum. If you're enjoying these videos and you'd like to keep up to date with all of the courses we're going to be running, make sure you head over to amauathome.com.